Hello, uh, my name is Martin. Today we are going to talk about data analysts' perspective on data frames in Apache Spark. I'm a data engineer at Tantus Data. At Tantus Data, we help clients with basically everything data related, so from cluster installations through application architecture, development, training, supporting teams of data analysts and data engineers. And I have been doing all of that, but on a daily basis I act as a data architect and data, data developer. During this talk, first of all, I am going to introduce you to what I mean by data analysts or data scientists perspective wh and why they are using Spark. Then we will have a quick walk through Spark execution model, so how Spark executes the program in the distributed environment. And then we will have a walk through multiple use cases, multiple problematic queries, which fails initially. And then we will have a look at why they fail. So at the end, you know how to fix such kind of queries. And the query selection is based on the fact that they are very common. So I'll show you very common failures. But at the same time, they, are, they will be quite easy to solve by, by anybody who is, not, uh, who is not very good at networking or garbage collection. So that makes it perfect use case uh, for, for data scientists, data analysts. And at the end, uh, I will uh, very quickly summarize the lesson learned from these problematic use cases. So let's start with data analysts slash scientists perspective. So what do they do? They look at the data and they try to explain what has happened and why. And the next step would be to use that knowledge in order to improve the product, in order to drive the decisions to be made by a company. And even step further would be to build machine learning models so you can automate this stuff, so you can, um, you can make it better. And this kind of things has been done for a very long time. So the traditional approach is that you take the data from the source, uh, you move it to maybe some R server or to your local machine, you do the analysis and you get the result. But if you have large data set, you, are you, have, to, you have to limit it. You have to either take a sample of your data or uh, an aggregate of, of your data set. And that means you might end up with this blind men and an elephant problem. So a few blind men are touching an elephant and they get completely different idea about what an elephant is. And something very similar might happen to your data if you're uh, looking at just limited data set. On the other hand, if you use Spark, you can analyze the whole data set because, uh, because it distributes the load. You can analyze the data set faster, you get faster feedback loop. And also since Spark kind of brings the, uh, the analysis to the data, not the other way around, you don't end up with extra data copies. And that might be quite important from the point of view of data privacy, GDPR, and stuff like that. So coming back to a data analyst's perspective, the end result of what you do is probably something quite, quite sophisticated algorithm, something maybe quite complex. But the reality is that in order to achieve that, you really have to run a lot of ad hoc queries to understand the data, to come up with, come, come up with reports, and so on, and also to do the data cleanup, so you come up with, um, with good feature set for your machine learning model. So this is a diagram I have found in the internet, and it says over 50% of machine uh, mach uh, data scientists' uh, time is spent on data cleanup. Probably you don't like that, but what you would like to achieve, at least, is that you run these kind of ad hoc queries as fast as possible. So Spark lets you express all kind of ad hoc queries. So even if you are not familiar with it, if you are familiar with SQL, then you see group by, join, select. You already know what this program is doing. But the problem is that sometimes queries just fail for not obvious reason. So imagine you are going to 
the office on Monday and you have like 26 queries you would like to run. Uh, so you understand the data better and you go further from there. And you hope to run them by the end of the day. But then you realize, OK, it's Wednesday already and I'm stuck with query number six. And it's not a cluster problem because all the other guys around me are running them. So what is going on? What do you do with queries which fail or uh, which never finish? So what we are going to do, we are going to do a quick deep dive into how Spark executes the program. So you have better disaster recovery plan than this. So asking for help is completely fine, but sometimes it's good if you, if you can solve the problem. So let's do the deep dive. The very first thing you have to keep in mind that when you work with data frames, it feels that you are working with some local collection. You are not exposed to any details about machines and stuff like that. But the data set is actually partitioned and it lives in multiple machines of your cluster. And Spark do two types of transformations on top of, uh, on top of the data frame. It do narrow transformations which work on single partition at a time. So the simple, simplest operation ever. And it does wide transformations where it has to exchange the data over the network. It has to exchange the data between multiple partitions. So just a very quick example. Let's say you want to calculate hash of a user ID and then reverse a column string and uh, maybe sum up two different columns. And you will end up with such an execution plan. So what that means is pretty much that Spark will read the input data. It will squeeze all these operations together. It will do the magic code generation to run it uh, in a performant way. And it will write the, write the result. So the point is that these kind of operations can be squeezed together and they are kind of executed locally uh, to, to each partition. And your execution plan might look slightly more complex, but the point is as long as these operations are in context of single stage, they will be executed kind of locally. But sometimes you want to do something more complex. So for instance, you would like to group your events based on user ID and maybe do some further analysis. So what Spark will have to do, it will have to pull all the events with user ID 1 to one place, all the events for user ID 2 to another place, and so on. So we have many arrows, uh, nodes are talking to each other, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of data is being exchanged here. So here are samples of operations which require to exchange data between partitions. Here are samples of operations which requires to do a shuffle. And we are going to focus on join and repartition. So I'll show you a few uh, use cases where, um, where, uh, where we use them. So this is like uh, just to give you an overview what it will look like in, uh, in Spark UI. When you write a program which does a join of users and, and events, this is what Spark UI would look like. And these arrows are indicators that the shuffle happens. These arrows indicate the, that, uh, that Spark will exchange the data between partitions. So in order to understand how Spark um, parallelized the load, I'll show you the simplest scenario ever first. So we read some events from, uh, from, from HDFS, and these events contains some timestamp column. And out of this timestamp column, you would like to, to calculate the year, month, and the day when the event happened. And Spark will squeeze all the calculation, all these three column calculation into into single operation inside one task. And one task will be reading a single block from HDFS, so a portion of your data. And eventually, it will write out the result. And if you have, let's say, your data set in 8,000 blocks in HDFS, it will create 8,000 tasks like that. So you will have many of them. All of them will look exactly the same. 
all of them are independent. There are no arrows between them. There is really nothing go going on between them. So it's very easy to parallelize. So it's very simple. So let's have a look at small extension of this use case. So we would like to organize our data set by the date. So we have uh, we we get better uh, better performing uh, queries. So if you are doing a lookup in your not organized data set based on uh, the year, Spark will have to scan the whole the whole data set and and f and, and filter filter out the events you are interested in. But on the other hand, if you organize your data by the year, so 2015 goes to one directory. 2016 to another one, and so on. You will end up with structure like this, and uh, the queries for a given year will perform much better. And of course, it's not a rocket science. It has been there for quite a long time. And what you would like to do, you would maybe like to organize it by not by year, by but by a day. And since this is very well known uh, approach to to optimizing the queries. Spark supports that out of the box. You can call partition by. You specify which columns you want to partition the data by. You're partitioning it here by day, month, and a year. And in many cases, it works. But I'll show you an example where it does not. So you run a program like this. Then you go to Spark UI. You can see that there is only one stage going on. and Spark tells you that all the task has finished, and you don't trust it, so you would like to go deeper and look at the task overview. And you can see many, many tasks, and all of them are marked as succeeded. But the job is still up and running. It's still marked as up and running, but you don't trust. Maybe you think the UI is somehow off. So you go to HDFS, and you list the directory where you expect the, the, the output. So you list the content of this directory, for instance, and you want to count the number of files there, and you get result 22. And like one minute later, you run it, and you notice that there is a difference. It's 25. And after some time, you run it, and, and you can see that basically the number of tasks in the output directory is still growing. So what is going on? In order to understand what's going on, you need to understand how the partition by method is implemented. So let's say you have 90 days of data in your, uh, in your, uh, in your input directory. Each task will read block from HDFS. It will calculate the columns. And it will write out single file, file per, per day because that's how you wanted it to partition by. And then you will have many of these tasks, because you have many blocks as an in input data. And by the end of the day, if you have 90 days of the data and like 8,000 blocks in HDFS, you will end up with this many blocks as an output. So you do the math, but the point is it's quite quite large number. And all of these files will be small, so it doesn't make that much sense. And the consequence will be that it will be slow. It will be slow because HDFS is not really optimized for, uh, for handling many small files. It's, ra it's rather optimized for, for batch workload. And what has happened here is that Spark has created the output in temporary directory, but now it's kind of moving the temporary directory uh, to, to the actual output location, and it's hammering name node, kind of a central piece of, uh, of HDFS. It's hammering the name node, and everything is just, just slow. But in extreme cases, you might even kill the cluster, and this is what your cluster admin will look like when he notices. And the problem is he actually knows who you are, so we want to fix that. So... Um, the way to fix that is actually quite simple. There is a method called repartition, and that can reorganize our data based on what we want to, but without touching HDFS. So we call the repartition. We specify the exact same columns we used for partition by. And then when we 
look at Spark UI, it will s be slightly more complex. We'll have two stages now. And what these stages will do is stage number one, a task in stage number one, will read the data from HDFS. It will do the column calculation. And it will organize the data by day, but it will save it just to the local disk. And all the other tasks will do exactly the same. And the rule here is that if, tasks, if day number three is going to the green bucket, it will always go to the green bucket. So it's consistent. So task number one in stage two can pull all the data for day one. Task number two will pull the day two, and so on. So here, we are processing single day, or maybe multiple days, but the whole day is processed by the same task as the end result, so we will end up with just one file in HDFS per day. So we have limited number of files. Initially, when we, uh, when we were running just partition by, we, the job was really slow, you so you have to know how the partition by works, but once you know that, you definitely should consider uh, repartitioning the data when you are writing it to HDFS. And in order to decide whether to use it or not, you need to know your data distribution. So repartition is the rescue here, but is it some kind of a silver bullet? Well, no, because I'm going to show you another use case where it when it actually fails after repartitioning. So let's say we run exactly the same code, just on different data set. So I'll show you my small example. I have run it, uh, I have run it on some small data set. Uh, the, the, the query plan looks exactly the same. And when uh, the, the stage number one has finished, so it has organized the data by day. It say it's stored it locally. But then you go to stage number two, and you want to see what is going on there. And what you can see here after um, sorting your tasks based on the amount of data they have read, you can see that three of your tasks have read like three gigabytes of data, but the other ones have read nothing and they are already succeeded. So they are just so lazy. And then you refresh the page and you can see these three tasks are growing and growing and growing. So the reason for that is I, in my data set, had just three days of data, and I'm repartitioning it by day. The rule is that the whole day is processed by single task after repartitioning, and you end up with such kind of problems. So imagine you have 100 gigs of data per day. Then your execution plan will, will look exactly as before, except single task will have to process 100 gigs of data. And most often, this is not what you want to do. Most often, you will end up with one of these problems. So first of all, Spark might try to avoid out of memory, and it will spill the data to disk. But it will be slow. And there are other possible problems which you can end up with, depending on what exactly you are doing after the repartition. So what, you, what could you do? You could try to split the data further. So you could try to repartition by hour. And that will, what, what that will do, so if we, are, if we are partitioning the data by day, then that means day number one will go to one task, and day number two will go to another one. But if instead you are repartitioning the data by something which splits the data further, if you have such a column, our number 11, day one, will go to one task. Our number one will go to another one, and so on. Sometimes it might be a little bit skewed, but still you are better off with doing that. And after running my job, I can see many more tasks which are actually doing something, and this is what I want to achieve. So when you are dealing with repartitioning of your data, First of all, you really need to have, you, you, really, you really need to know what your data looks like, how the keys are distributed. So you, you, you do it smart, you, you make sure 
uh, your executors are getting uh, enough load. And what you want to achieve, you really want to have to see all your tasks doing something at least. So, so you benefit from the fact that Spark is a distributed system. Okay, so we uh, have an idea of how Shuffle works for repartition. So let's have a look at join, something slightly more complex. So you want to join events with users based on user ID column. Spark will create three stages. Stage number one will organize your users based on the user ID. Stage number two will organize the events based on the user ID, so the key you are using for the join, and it will do it in a consistent way. Because it's consistent, then stage number three will pull the bucket one for users and the bucket one for events, so they are matching, and it will perform the partial join. Um, it will just perform the partial join here. Sta task number two will perform another part of the join, and so on. So this is what it will look like in the Spark UI, and I would like you to pay attention to this number. We have 200 here, and that means the, the join will be processed in 200 tasks. So there will be 200 tasks which will be pulling the data and, and processing part of it. And when I run some program performing the join, I can see that my tasks are, all of them are kind of busy, and all of them are reading some data, but I'm concerned about the amount of the data. I can see already almost 10 gigs, and I'm just doing simple join. Uh, and again, uh, this might be, might be problematic. So let's assume you are processing 10 terabytes of events, which are uniformly distributed across your users, and you are joining it with just one gigs of, of users, so some small user data set. The join will look exactly the same, and the question will be how many tasks in stage three, you will have how many tasks you will split the data into. Here is the answer. It's controlled by the Spark SQL Shuffle Partitions parameter, and that's why you saw 200 there. And if you are dealing with 10 terabytes of events, you're performing the join. And if we do a quick back of the envelope calculation, 10 terabytes split into 200 tasks is 50 gigs per task. This is too much. You want to keep your executor small for, uh, for this kind of jobs. So this is too much. So how do we, uh, how do we solve that? So th yeah, this is what it will look like. Uh, each task will get 50 gigs of the data. We end up with one of these problems again, one of these shuffle problems. So first of all, you have to understand your data. You have to know the size of your data and do the, actually do the back of the envelope calculation so you understand why it happens to you. But then, once you understand that, it, it is actually quite simple. You can just control the level of parallelism, so use this parameter and in increase the number of tasks. So you have more tasks, each of them will be processing less data because they are uniformly distributed. A similar problem might happen uh, to, uh, to when you do any other shuffle, uh, shuffle operation. So if you are doing repartition, you can also control number of partitions it will, it will create. So as the result, after changing the, um, the parameter, we can see 2,000 tasks here. Oh my god, really? We can see 2,000 tasks here, and each of them will be just processing smaller amount of data. But what if our data, what if our events are not really uniformly distributed? So let's have a look at case number four, four the skewed join. Sometimes it happens that when you run your job on this, 
on this like overview level, it looks exactly the same as before. But when I click here, I can see that many of my tasks are not doing that much. They are just processing some reasonable amount of data. But there is this one task which read much more data. This is one gig so far. It's not bad, but it's still growing. And eventually it explodes. So what if you are about to join 10 terabytes of events with one user who produced one terabyte of events. So one user has produced most of your events and you are joining by, by the user ID. Again, the way it will be done is exactly the same, but one of your tasks will have to process one terabyte of data and this will definitely explode. So what do you do if you have a, a skewed join problem? First of all, check if your data is correct. It might be that the data delivery mechanism is off and it's producing some null IDs and so on, so that means you have to change your data delivery. Then check if the logic you, you just created, maybe the way you are building the data frame is just off, maybe you have a bug in your logic and that means you have fixed your logic. But sometimes it's completely fine, you have data like this and you would like to still perform the join. So how do we do that? On the left hand side you can see events, on the right hand side you can see users, and this user ID number one happens to be, uh, hap happens to appear quite often and we would like to split that because it, he will go to, uh, to, the same, to the same task. So what we do is we generate a salt column where we randomly generate some value. Here we are just generating three different values. And what we do with users is we duplicate all of them with every single possible salt value. So from one to three, each user appears three times. And now, when you do the join, you join by not only user ID, but also the salt. So user ID one, salt one, goes to one place, salt2 is going to another task, and salt3 is going to one more task. So we have split that into three buckets. Usually you want to split it into, into more. So how do you do that? Uh, first of all, you have to calculate the, the salt at events, so the, the events with salt column. And you do that by adding an extra column where you basically create a uh, hundred different random values. Then you need to calculate the users, users salted. So um, first you create some dummy data frame with hundred different values, and then you do Cartesian join of users and these hundred dummy values. And then you join the events salted with users salted not only based on user ID, but also based on the salt value. So at the end, you won't have your tasks won't have to process this much data. You limit the, the, the amount of data per task. And this might sound as a little bit artificial problem for you, but this is something I can see very often when working with clients, and it's actually quite powerful technique. And of course, you can optimize it. You can generate salt for only, only the user which is problematic and so on. Uh, but, uh, but make sure you keep, keep in mind these kind of techniques. So the quick summary of the use cases I have, uh, I have shown you is that first of all, you have to know your data and that's really important. Size of your data, the distribution of your keys you are using when, when joining and so on. Then you really have to understand how the operators you are using uh, are working and you should pay attention to those ones which are triggering shuffle. So join is the, the, the most common one. And what you want to achieve in general is you want to keep all your tasks busy so you benefit from the fact Spark is a distributed system and you want to make sure that your tasks are not processing too much, too much data so, so maybe controlling the level of parallelism will help. And the 
There are many other challenges, but I would really recommend you to go back to these examples and make sure you understand them, maybe play around with them. Uh, because, for instance, when you, are, when you want to do broadcast variable, the whole point of broadcasting is that you avoid shuffle, so you have to know when shuffle happens uh, and what is the, the consequence. But if you would like to discuss any of, this, of these uh, problems or any problem with Spark, I would be happy to do that afterwards. And the last comment I would like to uh, I, would, I would like to make is that if you are a data scientist or data analyst, you definitely want to know how to fix the most common problems. But on the other hand, there are problems with Spark which, which are not really related to, to, to your expertise, which might be related to what happens in the cluster. Uh, with the general cluster state, or it might be bug with Spark. So if you feel that you are completely stuck and, and it's outside of your expertise, make sure you know where to go to work. Make sure you know where the data engineers are or where your DevOps are so they, they unblock you. Uh, I would be happy to uh, answer your questions now. I have actually posted the slides on my on my Twitter, uh, and I I also have uh, have posted a blog post about one of the use cases. I will be describing all of them soon, so follow me on Twitter if you are interested. So we have ten minutes question. Interesting talk. Thank you. What happens if you put some of Spark SQL inside your data frame? Is it good or bad to do that compared to doing things by hand? Well, uh, so behind the scene, it will do exactly the same, and it will use the same, uh, the same optimization engine and so on. I, like myself, I, I'm not a fan of SQL because it's just much easier for um, to test for me, and it's much easier to split that into. Uh, into the code into blocks, uh, but I know, like if you are data scientists, data data analysts, they they really many of them really like to do it. But and the point is, behind the scene, it will work exactly the same. So if you are writing a SQL and uh, and if you are uh, performing a join, the same thing will happen. So whether you are using this interface or SQL, it's still uh, the same. It's still the same, pretty much. Hi. So what is your usual debugging workflow? When you notice that a task is taking way too long, longer than it should be, how do you best, in your experience, go about debugging it? OK, so I actually tried to, um, in a very quick way, reproduce it here. So first of all, I look at, um, at the Spark UI, and I see an overview of the stage, which is problematic. Then I try to narrow down how this stage uh, matches the code and which part of the code uh, is is the problematic one. Then, if I suspect, for instance, we have a skew, I actually run a, an analysis on top of on top of it and see if it's if it's really a problem. Also, it's worth knowing that uh, where your logs are. So, like if you are using Spark on top of HDFS. Um, the, the logs should be automatically aggregated if you want to really go deeper and deeper. But for I would say for most for most queries, knowing your your data distribution and understanding uh, understanding how to read the data from the from the Spark UI, how to read some um, some hints, should be enough at least for for a data scientist. If you want to go deeper. Uh, definitely looking, looking into logs, looking into, into the query plan. Spark shows you uh, how it will, go, it will execute the query. Mm, but yeah, generally, it, it depends on, on, on the use case. But this is the most common one. Still have some time, I believe, so. OK, 
Okay, thank you.